In a library full of animation masterpieces, this one was relegated to second-class status. Delayed six months, nearly shelved after it was finished, instead quietly released as a contractual obligation before proving its true worth on home video. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of a goofy movie. Thank you to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress, plus two free pillows today. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. They made the sleep quiz to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to make the perfect mattress for you. Personally, I'm a side sleeper. I like a medium firmness in a mattress, and based on my results, Helix matched me with their Helix Midnight Lux, awarded CNET's 2022 Best Mattress for Couples. Day sleepers, night sleepers, afternoon sleepers, short naps, long naps, whenever and however you sleep. On your side, on your back, balled up with your knees held up to your chest, one leg hanging off the bed with your arms tucked behind your neck supporting your pillow, Helix can help you sleep better. What I like most about the Helix Sleep Mattress is that it features luxury memory foam for pressure point relief on my hips and shoulders. It's not too firm, not too soft at the top of the mattress, and it's perfect for couples with different feel preferences. I've had mattresses with springs that stick in your back, mattresses that are too thick in the middle or worse, sag after just a few weeks of sleeping on them. Hey, if you don't want to take my word for it, take it from a sleep expert. My cat, he lays on this thing all day. You can personalize your mattress even more by adding the Glaciotex cooling cover. It's a great way to keep you cool. You can easily shop for your new Helix Sleep mattress from the comfort of your own home, confident in your purchase because with Helix Sleep you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10 year warranty. There are financing options and flexible payment plans. If it makes you nervous to buy something you haven't tried, you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. The best part about all of this is that Helix delivers your mattress right to your door for free within the US. It comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set it up yourself. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Helix. Click on the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash toygalaxy for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress, plus two free pillows today. Thanks again to Helix Sleep. A Goofy Movie is a 1995 animated feature film produced by Disney Movie Tunes and Disney Television Animation, a sequel to the 1992 syndicated series Goof Troop, cementing the dominance of Goofy as the top television and theatrical star over Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. As the school year comes to a close, Max Goof finds himself looking forward to a summer where he no longer has to worry about the daily trauma of high school. But there is one last thing Max wants to take care of. Try to get Roxanne to notice him. He's got a huge crush on Roxanne, but those dreams turn into nightmares as he wrestles with his anxieties about getting older. About who he is now, and who he might one day become. He can't get around the fact that no matter how cool he tries to be, his dad will always be Goofy. Max's solution is to pretend to be someone else for a while. See if he can borrow some reputation from someone who has more than enough to go around. One of the biggest pop stars on the planet, Powerline. During the final assembly at school, Max and his friends PJ and Bobby hijack the video and audio to produce a surprise show starring a disguised Max, singing and dancing to Powerline's hit song, Stand Out. All the kids are thrilled right up to the moment where Max's goofy genetics inevitably result in the collapse of the whole facade and land him in the principal's office. But Roxanne was impressed and agrees to go to a sleepover slash Powerline concert viewing party with him next week, just in time for Principal Mazur to tell Goofy to reevaluate his parenting before Max ends up in the electric chair. Inspired by his neighbor Pete, Goofy plans a summer vacation of bonding with Max starting immediately, making the trek to Destiny Lake to go camping just like he did with his dad. Uh -huh. Max, look! It's the Leaning Tower of Cheesa. Of course, that will mean Max will miss his date with Roxanne. Rather than tell her the truth about his vacation, Max lies and says Goofy is friends with Powerline and that they are actually going to the concert in LA. Goofy's trust in his son and his own parenting will be tested when Max is forced to choose their final destination, fishing with his dad or the Powerline concert to impress Roxanne. It's a decision that will change both of their lives forever, their relationship to each other and to their place in the world. 
A Goofy movie was conceived as the continuation of characters and themes that began in the 1992 syndicated series Goof Troop, in which Goofy Goof is a single father to Max Goof, which is not unprecedented for Goofy as a character. Goofy made his debut in Walt Disney's Mickey's Review in 1932 as Dippy Daug, an appearance that established his signature laugh, if not his final look and name. By 1951, he had had several makeovers, and the focus of his cartoons had gone from background extra to Mickey and Donald's sidekick, then perennial victim in his own series of how-to videos, and finally, Avatar of Suburban Mundanity. The 1950s cartoons featured Goofy as husband and father. While he was always considered human, despite his anthropomorphic dog features, this version nearly removed those aspects entirely in service of relatability. Instead of Goofy, he was now George Geef, his floppy ears shortened if not entirely hidden, his fur just the hair on the top of his head, and his voice a much more normal speech pattern without the emphasis on gawrshing all the time. You say gawrsh? Gawrsh. <laughs> That's it. That's the one. <laughs> it's this Goofy that influences so much of Goof Troop. Created by Robert Taylor and Michael Peraza Jr., the series continues to explore the father-son dynamic by casting Goofy as more a figure of harmless familiarity as opposed to hapless dogman. Goof Troop technically ran two seasons, 65 episodes in daily syndication, while simultaneously airing 13 episodes on Saturday mornings, even though they both aired in a single year from 1992 to 1993. Part of the Disney afternoon block of cartoons, those 78 episodes would continue to air as reruns through 1996. A Goofy movie was the result of a suggestion from Jeffrey Katzenberg, head of Walt Disney Studios. Katzenberg had been the head of Disney Animation, among other things, since he was hired by brand new chairman and CEO Michael Eisner in 1984. Katzenberg was responsible for helping save Disney Animation from obsolescence. In 1984, the studio was floundering after the departure of veteran animator Don Bluth and several other animators to form Don Bluth Studios. That, combined with the money pit called The Black Cauldron, a film that was mired in production limbo for over a decade and cost $44 million to make $22 million. The first thing Katzenberg did when he arrived at Disney was personally recut The Black Cauldron, shortening it by 15 minutes, then kick it out the door, releasing it in 1985, five years after its intended street date. From there, things picked up. Katzenberg helped steer Disney animation into an incredible streak of classics and box office hits over the next decade. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin and the Lion King. Beauty and the Beast is one movie. Aladdin and the Lion King are two different movies. Can you imagine? It was Katzenberg that initiated the idea of a Goofy movie and furthermore drew on his own experience for its central theme, generational bonding through prolonged car confinement. As a parent, he had recently had a breakthrough in the strained relationship with his own teenage daughter. He pitched the idea to Goof Troop story supervisor Jim Magon, who put together a script for a full feature length film, a sequel that would see Max grown up as if he had aged more realistically since the first season aired in 1992. During Goof Troop, Max was around 11 years old. For the movie intended to be released in 1994, he would be a teenager in high school. Disney animator Kevin Lima was brought on to direct and stated that one of their main goals was to give Goofy some emotional depth, make him a character instead of just a succession of antics. Many of the same cast members from Goof Troop were brought on to play the same characters in a Goofy movie. Jim Cummings returned as Goofy's neighbor Pete. Rob Paulson was back as Pete's son, Max's best friend PJ. Max himself got a vocal adjustment in order to further emphasize that Max was older now. Jason Marsden took over from Dana Hill with Aaron Lore performing Max's songs. Kelly Martin played Roxanne Blossom star. Jenna Van Oy played Roxanne's friend and student class president Stacy. And in an uncredited role, Polly Shore played Bobby Zimmerski. Mm -hmm. Max, look, it's the Leaning Tower of Cheesa. Goofy was played by Bill Farmer, the same person who'd been playing him since 1987. However, Katzenberg requested that Farmer use a regular speaking voice for Goofy, something that would have further humanized the character and thereby the story. Whether it was an intentional homage to Goofy's 1950s suburban adventures as George Geef or not, Farmer wasn't interested, insisting that the audience would probably want to hear a Goofy that sounded like Goofy. CEO Michael Eisner and Walt's nephew Roy Disney agreed with Farmer, authorizing the switch back to Farmer's goofy, goofy voice after nearly two weeks of recording dialogue. From Walt Disney Pictures, Max is the most popular kid in school. Max! Max! His girlfriend's a babe. Call you later. Okay. His best bud is cool. It's the Leaning Tower of Cheesa. There's only one problem. His dad's goofy. Ah! Son. Dad. It's Goofy and Max. Ow. In the movie, Siskel and Ebert give two thumbs up. You look just like I did at your age. Please don't say that, Dad. A Goofy movie, rated G. Now playing at a theater near you. 
Music was a big part of a goofy movie. It's not a musical per se, but at times it certainly functions like one, and not just because a concert and the biggest pop star in the world are central to the story. Carter Burwell composed a score that was later recomposed by Don Davis. Burwell explained that the initial composition was less traditional, featuring banjo, percussion, and choir. However, as with Goofy's voice, Disney wanted something more typical of a feature film with symphonic orchestration. Powerline is a key figure in the story, a pop music star, an amalgamation of Michael Jackson, Prince, and Bobby Brown, an idealized representation of what Max thinks he could be if he weren't the son of Goofy. Powerline's songs Eye to Eye and Stand Out were performed by Tevin Campbell, whose first two albums had already been certified platinum and double platinum. While some have claimed that Powerline was originally voiced by Bobby Brown, director Kevin Lima debunked that in a 2020 article on Slash Film saying, quote, it's not true at all. He never recorded anything as far as I know. A Goofy movie found itself produced and released amid a cloud of production delays and corporate controversy. According to a 2020 interview in Vanity Fair, director Lima explained that significant reshoots had to be conducted due to faulty equipment. Quote, in those early days, you'd set up a camera looking at a large monitor and you would film that monitor. One of the pixels was blown out and every single scene in the movie had a black dot in it. So we had to go back and reshoot three quarters of the movie. At the same time, the entire structure of Disney management was undergoing its biggest rearrangement since the arrival of Eisner and Katzenberg in 1984. In October of 1993, Katzenberg told Eisner that he wanted a promotion based on the previously mentioned streak of Disney classics and box office hits, which some have said was responsible for as much as 80% of Disney's rise in stock value over that time. Problem was, Katzenberg was already the number three guy. The only job other than Eisner's was the number two guy, President and COO Frank Wells. And technically, Wells didn't report to Eisner, he reported to the board of directors. Wells had been brought in by the board that included Walt's nephew Roy in 1984 before they brought in Eisner and Eisner brought in Katzenberg. Think of Wells and Eisner as co-managers. Wells was big picture, Eisner was day to day. The board didn't want Katzenberg in the number two spot. Eisner declined to promote Katzenberg, explaining that replacing Wells would hurt Wells' feelings. According to Katzenberg, Eisner then promised that if for any reason Wells wasn't there, Katzenberg would be the person to get the job. Six months later, on April 3rd, 1994, Frank Wells died in a helicopter crash after a skiing trip in Nevada's Ruby Mountains. Bad weather overwhelmed the small helicopter's engines, and four of the five people on board, including Wells, were killed. Out of respect for the tragedy, any conversation about promoting Katzenberg was put on hold with Eisner himself assuming Wells' responsibilities. The Lion King opened in June of 1994, and one month later, Eisner was hospitalized with chest pains and subsequently for heart surgery. Katzenberg was angry that Eisner hadn't made a decision. The media and shareholders were increasingly impatient, wondering who was going to replace Wells and when. Eisner was feeling pressure from all sides and tensions ran high as he felt like Katzenberg was intentionally trying to force the negotiations into the public sphere. Eisner ultimately concluded that Katzenberg was the biggest threat to him within Disney and therefore fired him in August of 1994. Katzenberg then sued Disney and walked away with a $250 million settlement. In October of 1994, Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen announced their new multimedia production studio, DreamWorks SKG, an immediate threat to Disney's dominance in the industry. A goofy movie was supposed to be released for Thanksgiving in November of 1994. The dead pixel reshoots pushed it back six months, leaving Disney to take The Lion King out of theaters in September and re-release it in that November slot. A Goofy movie was finally released April 7, 1995, the fulfillment of a contractual obligation as far as Disney was concerned, the very opposite of a celebration of the legacy of the guy that had brought this movie and so many others to the studio. Any grand plans Katzenberg or the production had intended around its release were cut. The movie was left to succeed or fail on the audience finding it for themselves. Good luck with Michael Bay's Bad Boys opening the same weekend. A Goofy movie brought in $35 million in the U.S. and a scant $2 million worldwide because Disney didn't even bother giving it a full international release. While technically commercially profitable, doubling its budget, it all but disappeared in the clamor of excitement for Disney's other 1995 films, Pocahontas in June and Toy Story in November. Roger Ebert gave it three out of four stars, Louis Black gave it one star and called it bland, a barely television-length cartoon stretched out to fill a feature and not much fun. Peter Stack said it was brutal, and there's no denying that a Goofy movie can't be a proud moment for Walt Disney Pictures. A Goofy movie was released on VHS and Laserdisc in September of 1995, on DVD in 2000, 2000 and Blu-ray in 2019. Today, of course, you can stream it on Disney Plus as well, but it's that 1995 release that changed the fate of the movie. 
Home media is where a goofy movie finally found the fans that not only embraced it, but elevated it to its proper place as a modern Disney classic, forcing Disney to recognize the audience that had grown around it and thereby putting a sequel into production. Within five years in 2000, Disney released an extremely goofy movie on the strength of that enthusiasm. Yes, there were a lot of direct-to-video sequels released by Disney at the time, but a goofy movie didn't have the pedigree of Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Pocahontas, or The Lion King. Movies with a combined box office of over two billion dollars. An entire generation of kids grew up with Stand Out and Eye to Eye as not just their favorite Disney songs, but some of their favorite songs, period. Today it is still gaining fans and retroactively elevating its profile as those kids pass it on to their kids. The 20th anniversary of a Goofy Movie panel at D23 in 2015 was the most popular panel of the entire event, with hundreds of people being turned away because the 500-seat room was already at capacity. And there are several theories as to why this happened with this movie. In a 2020 article with Vanity Fair, director Kevin Lima credits the movie's emotional heft, saying, quote, At some point or another, we all feel this way about our parents. We want to disconnect with our parents, only to realize years later that they were okay. They were doing their best. They loved me. From that same article, writer Jim Magon said, quote, People come up to me all the time and say, This is the only film that made me connect with my dad. That kind of stuff. I find it really touching. Producer Don Hahn said, It has every hallmark in terms of its emotion and relationships and humanity and storytelling and connection that you expect from a Disney classic. And that's all true, but another explanation emerged in 2015 with an article written by Jordan Calhoun on blacknerdproblems.com titled, 20 years ago, a goofy movie became the blackest, most underrated nerd classic of all time. Jordan makes the case for why this particular film at this particular moment in pop culture and society spoke to kids like him and the experiences they were going through. Quote, a pretty good kid, Max, was easily misunderstood by a bum-ass principal who recklessly labeled him based on his baggy clothes. How quick did Principal Mazur brand him? Do you remember what Max was called? Dressed like a gang member, your son caused the entire student body to break out in a riotous frenzy. If I were you, Mr. Goof, I'd seriously reevaluate the way you're raising your child before he ends up in the electric chair. Gang member, riot, any of those sound familiar? In an article on TheOutline.com in 2019, Dylan Thomas Jones pushes back on that read, suggesting that if Max is an example of positive representation, then it cannot be ignored that Goofy is a negative reinforcement of harmful stereotype, and that he, as a viewer, felt, quote, dread that no matter how I style or present myself, someone will see some Goofy in me and shame to it being emotionally invested in the very ideas I reject. The movie reminded me that I have no real control over the production of representations of blackness, nor their essential meaning, and very little over the gut-level feeling these representations evoke in me." End quote. That final point made sharpest with the observation that the director and all three writers were white, not to mention the voice actors for Goofy and Max. There are many paths to classic, whether that be cult or a gold-trimmed Blu-ray box in the Disney vaults. The point is, it's nearly 30 years later and you can go to Hot Topic's website right now and sift through more Goofy Movie licensed merchandise than was available the day the movie was released. In October of 2022, an entire episode of Atlanta was dedicated to airing a mockumentary about the making of a Goofy movie. It tells the story of the rise and fall of a fictional animator turned executive named Thomas Washington who is accidentally named CEO of Disney and immediately sets out to make the blackest movie of all time. A Goofy Movie is a Disney classic. It is an enduring beloved film that is gaining fans with each passing year as the emotional impact of the film is shared generationally. Viewers who related to Max finding themselves suddenly relating to Goofy and everyone singing along to the songs of Powerline. <clears throat> do I usually clap there? I never remember. I don't put it in the script, but I always do. Thanks for watching. Please hit like and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if a goofy movie made an impact on your life. Disney Afternoon was regular viewing for me, so I definitely knew about Goof Troop. By the time a goofy movie came out, I was working at a movie theater as an usher, so while I did see the entire movie, eventually I never saw it in a single sitting until years later. A weird way to see movies, but such is the life of an usher. Telling kids to be quiet, cleaning up wet popcorn, and stretching a 90-minute movie <laughs> into 15-minute chunks over the course of three weeks. Cut. That's how I still watch movies.